gentlemen, if we can make a start, please. Uh, my name is Graham Moon. I'm a professor of health geography in geography and environment here at Southampton. And I'm the co-chair of the Population Health University Strategic Research Group. I'm introducing this session because this is the, the second of our public lectures from the, public, from the Population Health Strategic Research Group. And it's a prestigious series, and we've been very pleased to be able to, to run it over the past two to three years' lifetime of the research group. It gives me even greater pleasure, however, to introduce our speaker for today, who is Professor Danny Dawling from the University of Oxford, where he's the Halford McKinder Professor of Geography. Danny is a social geographer with interests across a wide variety of areas spanning education, housing, but importantly for us today, <coughs> health related issues. Danny's held positions at many of the UK's leading universities, Newcastle, Sheffield and most latterly in Oxford to which he's returned, having been a native of the city, if not the university. Um, most of Danny's work will, I hope, be familiar to many of you. Danny is, in many ways, the chief manifestation of the public geographer. He's well known for his work on inequality, for his critical and politically committed views on inequality in Britain today. Those views have been aired at meetings nationally and internationally, and probably the last but one time I met Danny, we were both based out in New Zealand, and I'm sure it's somewhere where we both wish to return, but for the moment we're both here, and looking forward to listening to Danny's thoughts on inequality in relation to health issues and his title, Are More People Dying Because the Rich Are Getting Richer at the Expense of the Rest? So I hand over to you, Danny, and welcome. Uh, thank you very much for coming. The short answer is yes, in case, you, in case you're wondering. Uh, but it, it has to be a little bit more subtle and a bit co more complicated than that. Uh, is there an echo at the back? Yeah. Yeah. Let's try getting rid of that. Is that better? Yes. Okay, great. Um, we do have more people dying in this country than in similar countries as I'm about to show you. We also have more people dying in recent years than were dying a few years ago, particularly the very elderly. There's been an absolute rise in mortality amongst elderly women, which has been very little commented upon in the last few years. It is, of course, very hard to pin down exactly why this is, but there are an awfully large number of coincidences with austerity, with the cuts, with cuts to home visits to the elderly, with cuts to pension credits, and a whole series of academic papers currently being produced, some being refereed, some actually appearing in journals saying the coincidence is too high. So that's the immediate worry. The longer term worry is that this country has more ill health than similarly affluent countries because the rich take so much in this country compared to other countries. And it has all kinds of effects that we take for granted that we shouldn't take for granted. I was talking about these issues in September in uh, the University of York. And I was giving the example of school teachers then. School teachers in Oxford, where I now live, being unable to start a family because they couldn't do anything else than rent a room unless they had inherited wealth. And the effect this had on teachers. And it's shocking to look back at what she did a few months ago and then realised we now start talking about junior doctors, talking about whether they can actually uh, 
start a family in the more expensive parts of the country and what effect that may have on them and also what effect it has on getting junior doctors into your area. Last week I was talking to a very, very affluent man who rents out property in the city of Oxford who had been in hospital in the JR recently who said how sorry he felt for the junior doctors because they are finding it so hard to pay the rent to him because he was a landlord and he wanted to do something about it. I was too polite to say there's a really obvious thing he could do about it but of course you just can't do this on your own you can't solve societal problems on your own but there is a wide spread desire to solve them including amongst people at the top of society we don't live in a country where those at the top of our society are wanting to damage our health Margaret Thatcher several years into her reign as Prime Minister, signed the World Health Organization targets, committing Britain to halving health inequalities by the year 2000. Margaret Thatcher didn't particularly like targets, but she was so convinced that what she was doing, letting the tall poppies rise, getting rid of state regulation, giving people a chance, she was so convinced it was the right thing to do and that the money would trickle down and that everybody would be happier as a result if they worked harder. That she signed a document, I think in 1985, saying that by the year 2000 the gap in health between rich and poor people would have halved and the gap in health between rich and poor areas would have halved. She honestly believed that was going to happen. Of course, it doubled. Um, but I, don't, I honestly don't think people at the top of society do realise that if they follow their beliefs, these differences will carry on widening. I sometimes do worry. I sometimes do worry, are there people at the top of our society who think actually health inequalities widen if more of the children of the poor die? Might not be a bad thing. They might be a burden on the rest of us, but I don't I don't think there are many people like this. But the fact I have to share my worry with you shows the kind of point we've got to. Uh, we certainly have a government who in the last few months have instigated a two-child policy for the poor, saying that if you have a third child in about 18 months from now, you will receive no benefits for that third child unless you can prove you had that third child because you were raped. Now that is a bizarre situation to have got into. First of many graphs, I'm afraid there are going to be a lot of these graphs, this graph appears in very obscure places on the web. This is target 1A of the National Health Service, the primary target of the National Health Service. The line is the rate of deaths of uh, potential years of life lost from preventable diseases. Over time, this tends to improve. We get better and better at preventing people dying. People get better at looking after their own health. We're better fed and so on. So you'd expect it to be falling over time, it has stalled <laughs> since 2010. Not much of a fuss yet, because of the obscure places it exists. I wrote about it a few months ago. There's the reference if you want to see where the NHS references are. If you are a senior NHS administrator, don't put documents up on the web. Um, I don't think they meant it to be published, but you put it on the web, it's published. Why have you got a geographer standing in front of you rather than a clinician or somebody who actually knows about what they're talking about? Uh, and there are disadvantages to, to having people like me. We do not know many things in depth. <coughs> but there are complications. There are all kinds of things going on that you need to take into account when you're looking at some of these trends. If we think again about those elderly women, it's about an extra 30,000 elderly women of the age of the women that Harold Shipman killed, which is one of the reasons why there hasn't been many fuss that more of them have died. The number of reasons you can come up to as why the life expectancy of elderly women has fallen are huge. When it first happened, Public Health England said it was the cold, said it was flu. But then we got the death certificates and they didn't mention flu and people weren't dying of cold in other countries and it wasn't actually that cold compared to the winter of 2010 when a number of deaths hadn't risen. And then they said it was the taking up of smoking by elderly women in the 1970s. 
but the cause of death wasn't related to smoking related diseases and also you don't get a sudden jump that fast from taking up smoking slowly. The deaths were actually dementia and pneumonia. There were falls in those visits as I've told you, these are the visits from social workers, the fairly useless visits. There's been um, studies of these visits, you know, you turn up for 15 minutes, make a cup of tea, put your coat on, go, drive to the next person and see. These visits are fairly useless except for finding somebody who's fallen down to the bottom of the stairs and is still alive and they have halved with the cuts. But that might not be the key. Because at the same time as those visits halved from social workers who are paid to visit the elderly living on their own, the number of car journeys in Britain fell by 10% and our carbon pollution fell by 10%, which was very good news. But who do you not drive to see when you're reducing how much you drive because the price of petrol went up? So it's not impossible that people not visiting their elderly relatives. And these, the key point about the fact that these are women is that they're much more likely to be living on their own. Life is harder living on your own than for men. And of course the income will be lower because women's pensions are lower. But it might not just be that. The pound fell by 20% at the beginning of the recession, so the number of people who could get out of the country and retire somewhere else fell. We cut warm winter payments to people living abroad, which sounds very sensible, but if somebody is eking out life in Malta and doing it partly because they get these warm winter payments in the winter if it's cold in Britain, and they can't stay in Malta anymore when their pension is cut, so they come back, and we have to provide them with hospital care, it's certainly not such a great saving having reduced those pensions. And I can go on and on. We do not know the answers to many of these things. Um, somebody might retort when I show you some of the statistics later that, well, life expectancy in this country is still going up. It's going up overall just as fast as it's going up in nearby European countries. So what's my problem? OK, it's falling for the elderly women, but it's rising for young adults. They appear to be getting healthier and healthier. They're getting most healthy in London, where the biggest improvements of life expectancy are seen. So what's happened in London in the last 10 years? Lots of people have come into London, not any old people. Young, highly qualified, mainly from mainland Europe, extremely fit, healthy people. If you take the migrants out who've arrived, then we no longer have the incredible boost to our life expectancy that, that we see. Uh, because we've had healthy migration from abroad at an historically unprecedented level. I'll try not to have so many diversions in the rest of what I say, but the point I'm trying to get <coughs> over is when you're looking at these issues, there are many things going on at once. <coughs> I've mentioned the elderly women enough already, but it really does matter and it's easy to watch. It's easy to forget. We also have increasing levels of poor mental health, of anxiety and depression, partly for the very, very rational reason that it is more sensible to be anxious and depressed now than it was before 2008. You can try and talk people out of it, or you can give them drugs to take them away from the reality of it, but we now live in a more worrying world than we did before. And then we get to those at the top and what those at the top think. And it shocks me what those at the top say and think. David Cameron yesterday in Prime Minister's Questions, when asked if somebody on the new living wage of under £10 an hour whether somebody on under £10 an hour would be able to afford one of the affordable starter homes for £450,000, said yes, of course they would. <laughs> now, you don't have to be a genius to work out that if you're on £10 an hour, even if there's two of you, and somebody decides that they're going to give you a mortgage, even at the incredibly low mortgage rates we have now, it would take you over, I think, 90 years to be able to buy that house. I honestly believe David Cameron doesn't know that he said something so very wrong.
because he thinks that 450,000 is very cheap for a house and maths was never his strong point. <laughs> uh, George Osborne. This, interestingly, is, is, is a good example of something clever from George. Every single sentence there is actually true. So the spad who wrote that for George got it right. They have about 11 spads now, which makes it easier. But George also said recently that the UK only has 1% of the world's adult, but 6% of the world's welfare bill. And this was wrong because we are a high-tax, high-spending country. I want you to remember that for what they're going to say next. I do not think they are being disingenuous. I think they believe the things they say and never meet anybody who points out the very simple way in which a lot of these things are wrong. Um, I honestly believe somebody taught George a version of history which said that it was the Conservatives who helped people with the meals and those terrible conditions. It was the Conservatives who took great step forwards towards state education, that's the 44 Act. It was the Conservatives who introduced equal votes for women, eventually, reluctantly. It was the Conservatives who gave people the right to buy, which incidentally I agree with, but of course the majority of those houses are now being purchased by landlords who are renting them out at twice the rent to people. And I bet George actually thinks this is the party for working people in Britain. But it shows you what a mess of a country you can get when somebody can say that as an ad lib at the end of his budget speech. And not realise that it will be quoted back to him for the rest of his life as an example of how disconnected he was from the country in which he was living. And it, it's been like this before. But before, and I'll show you a graph in a minute that says how similar we are to the 1930s when John Maynard Keynes was writing. Before we were actually coming together, we were not dividing. We were most economically divided around about 1913, just about the point when the Titanic was sinking and people were on the different decks. Our economic divisions fell in the 1920s, although we didn't realise it fell with the general strike and the fell slightly with the crash and they fell with the huge increases in taxation that were required to pay for the First World War and then the Second World War. But there were also huge differences then between people like Keynes and people living average lives and people living poor lives. Uh, Keynes' friend Falk, Oswald Falk was a banker and said what Keynes had really done, this was in 1936, was simply codified the moral feelings of an age because the moral feelings by 1936 was that people had been doing things the wrong way and in a, an immoral way and this has resulted in a crash in 1929 and you couldn't carry on like this it had to change, equality had to rise you had to have more respect for people and partly because that was what people at the top came to believe in the 1930s you get this incredible reduction in inequality which this graph shows. The top line is a share of the best off 1%. The bottom line is the share after tax. Uh, little diamonds are general elections, which are not very important. Um, you can see it going down from the richest 1% taking a fifth of all income uh, around about the time of the First World War to the richest 1% when I was a child taking just 6% of all income or 4% after tax. Uh, we were s just about as equal as Sweden when I was a child. Probably the second most equal large country in Europe. And then the relentless rise of the take of the 1% again and a little divergence at the end as we brought in the 50p tax rate and then it was cut to 45p. The cartoon there is a modernised version of the 1936 cartoon in which there are four men and all the men are stepping down and the man at the bottom is drowning. The difference now is that the man at the top is stepping up and that's my worry about what's going on at the moment. Everybody else is stepping down. Inequalities in income for 99% of the population have actually fallen since 2008 back to the level they were in 1992 although the welfare cuts at the bottom are going to increase inequality again. 
But once you include the top 1%, none of that coming together ends up being true anymore. Uh, you're told, of course, this is inevitable. You're told it's what you need to win the global race. It's good for us all. If we didn't do this, we couldn't afford the NHS. It's wealth creation. It's because of talent, and it's happening everywhere. And you are repeatedly lied to by people who do not know they're lying, which is more dangerous, I think, than people who do know they're lying. I'm just going to show you three figures like this. This is the ratio of incomes of the best off tenth to the worst off tenth of households in the richest 25 countries in the world, which have at least 2 million people. The data is from about five years ago. The most equal country is Japan, where the best off tenth have about four and a half times more money than the worst off tenth. So it's not utopia, there's still big inequalities in, in Japan. And then the Scandinavian countries very nicely sorted themselves out in order, Finland, Norway, Sweden. And then Germany, which is hardly an economic tragedy. Uh, then Austria, Slovenia, South Korea, Denmark, Belgium and Switzerland. Switzerland has bankers, lots of them. Uh, they are paid on average half as much as our bankers. And they don't all come to London. France, the Netherlands, Ireland, Canada, Greece, Spain, Italy, New Zealand, which me and Graham like so much. Part of our excuse for going to New Zealand is actually to study similar levels of inequality to ourselves and a country that tried to get rid of the welfare state before we did, partly because it was a country that brought in the welfare state before we did in the 1930s. And then Australia and then Israel, which as you probably realise is a very unequal country. But above Israel comes the United Kingdom. We have a bigger rate of inequality between the best off tenth and the poorest tenth than in Israel. We are a more divided country socially than is Israel. Right? Now, there aren't bombs going off and there isn't a war, but we have that degree of difference. But we're used to it, so we don't see ourselves as strange. The best off 10% now are taking 28% of all income in this country. Nowhere else in Europe <coughs> do the best of 10% take such a big share? Somebody has to be the most unequal country in Europe. It's us, and we don't know it. And why do the best of 10%, which includes people like me, take 28% of all income? Because within that best of 10%, the 1% are taking 14%. They're taking half of it. So the rest of us very well paid business people, university professors, doctors, consultants, head teachers, civil servants, members of parliament, the rest of us well paid people, don't think we're being greedy because that 1% are taking so much and also we just want to be able to buy a house like our parents could buy a house but the prices of houses have gone up because if you let people at the top take more and more and more, that's what happens. And so what do our ministers say? The Prime Minister said that inequality was falling. The Prime Minister believes that inequality is falling. So what he's told the Prime Minister that inequality is falling and it's useful for the Prime Minister to believe what he's told by the person who <coughs> makes the Prime Minister happy, who presumably keeps his job because he tells the Prime Minister that inequality is falling. And when the Prime Minister says that inequality is falling, The Economist magazine, that Trotskyist kind of revolutionary publication, <laughs> draws a graph to show why the Prime Minister is not saying the truth. The Prime Minister is talking about the blue line. The blue line is the best off, bottom of the best off 10% compared to the top of the worst off 10%. It's complicated, which is why David doesn't understand it. The red line includes the 1% share. As soon as you include the 1%, which of course is everybody he knows, and has known since he was young, as soon as you include the 1%, it's the other way around. Oh, but can't we just forget about the 1%? I mean, okay, we're quite a large room here. But we probably don't have somebody in the 1%. I'll just do a quick poll. Um, anybody got a household income of over £200,000 a year? No, okay. 
All right, so, so we are the 99%, okay? The revolution starts here. I, I didn't expect you to come clean. Uh, if you are, if, if you're on your own, by the way, 160,000 income gets you in the 1%. Um, they don't matter, they're separate, they're different, they are somehow. That, that's the argument, and we, we'll get back to that in, in a minute. But why are those junior doctors wanting to keep their salaries which aren't actually that bad? What's going on there? In the 1970s, a general practitioner or a fairly junior consultant would be in the 1%. Their income was about £50,000 in today's terms. Half as much as it is now but they were in the 1% because bankers were paid so much less in the 1970s. Head teachers were in the 1%. Nowadays, there are only just over 200 GPs who are in the 1%. And those are general practitioners who also own their own pharmacies, just 200 of them. What does this mean to the doctors? Because they're still pretty well off. You're looking at an income of over 100,000 pounds a year. It means they can't live in the kind of houses that doctors used to live in. Uh, so, a GP a little bit younger than me in Oxford is living in a tiny house. Now, they should get used to living in a tiny house, but this is why the 1% matters, because what happens is your medics and your doctors and your head teachers and all those other people who are kind of used to be around that level don't consider themselves to be greedy when they want more money, because they're just trying to stay still and be able to live in town and be able to start a family and have two kids and send them to school. But the amount of money it takes to do that and so things begin to break down and you end up with lots of people coming to live in flats in Southampton, I guess, and getting on trains every day to London. Um, these statistics are not great, but they're the best we have worldwide. And they're looking at those inequality rates that I've just shown you, which are from five years ago to the most recent numbers. And the best we can do with just a straight line prediction, so it really is dodgy, but it's all we have got, is that already Portugal, which was above us, has dropped down because house prices have halved in Lisbon. And you know who owned the houses, it wasn't the poor. Portugal's dropped down. Singapore has brought in capital controls to stop more rich people moving into Singapore and buying flats and leaving them empty very sensible thing to do. Barack Obama has increased taxation in America. He's actually achieved an enormous amount, uh, but it hasn't been appreciated greatly because compared to a European norm, it doesn't look good. But Barack Obama is, has done things which are going to make America and already are making America more equal. And the result is that by 2026, we are going to win that global race we are heading to become the most unequal country economically out of the richest 25. Somebody has to be. Uh, and that's where we are currently going on the current trends. But so what? Might actually be good. Might bring in money, we might get more billionaires, more innovations, more inventions, more people who can invent vacuum cleaners, whatever the wealth creators actually do. Why does it matter for health? There are all kinds of correlations between economic inequality and, and health. Uh, this is infant mortality, which is shockingly high in the United States, um, then in New Zealand, and then us. There's nowhere else in Europe which has our rate of, of infant mortality. I'm just going to say some more statistics about children. And they're more dramatic about children than for adults because adult health reflects the decades you've lived through. So if you think of somebody of my age or older, then you're looking at having grown up in a relatively equitable time, um, and then some damage from the 1980s unemployment, and then not so bad and so on. So there's a big lag between life expectancy and equality. There's much less of a lag between infant mortality and inequality. Inequality along the bottom, infant mortality along the side. The good news about that graph uh, is that the rates are now incredibly low. But you're still looking at twice as many grieving parents in the United States than in Japan. 
6,000 children die every year in the UK. Uh, the Lancet in 2014 put us at the bottom of the Western European League table, below countries like Cyprus, Greece, Spain and Portugal, having more in line with Poland and Serbia. This is back in 2014. Did you know this? Is it common knowledge? Do we talk about the health of our children as being so poor? Or do we think, isn't it great we've got that lovely children's hospital, isn't it nice? And the BBC do children in need every year with that nice pudgy bear. We don't know we're this bad. This is how you could end up with the worst economic inequality in Europe. If you don't also know that you have some of the worst child health in Europe. You've got to go to Romania to find somewhere where newborn children have as bad a chance as Northern Ireland. But this is what it's like to be in an unequal country. And again, that bottom off, best off 10% taking 28%. It leaves only just over 2.7% for the, for the worst off 10%. It is growing up in poverty. It is being a very, very poor adult at the point you become pregnant. These are the correlations. They're worse in the United States because people are in an even worse situation. And in a normal European country, you do not become a parent in abject poverty in the way that you do in the United Kingdom. And the result, this is a quote reference from another paper, stunning paper from Sweden that I think looked at over 20 causes of death. And on every single one, every cause without exception, from congenital malformations to road traffic accidents, children in Sweden were less likely to die. Now, medics study individual causes. They study congenital malformations. They study children getting babies, getting the cord wrapped around their neck and dying and so on. But when you see that it is for every cause, you have to step back and actually say something else is going on here, uh, which is wider and matters. And while we should get angry about it, because it is staggeringly unfair, this isn't a subtle difference between us and Sweden, it isn't a few things, it's a staggeringly wide difference. Um, references, because that is my day job, I'm supposed to give references, all these things are known. And I think one of the things that shocks me is the fact that this isn't new. Okay, it's been getting slowly worse, and then we get slightly worse statistics one year than the rest, and then we're a bit shocked <coughs> by some of them. But we've acclimatised to it, we've become used to the idea that this is just how things are. Well, let me say where well, they shouldn't smoke, they should take less drugs, they should look after themselves, they should eat five a day or seven a day. Why can't they be like me? Why can't they be responsible? Why can't they be 50? Um, and we think we are normal and we think we're knowledgeable about our country compared to other countries. And we don't know that our children are twice as likely to die crossing the road than in France or Norway or the Netherlands. We don't know that in Sweden they have Vision Zero, which is by 2020 not a single child or adult should die on the roads. We already have a hundred cities and towns in Britain that have gone to 20 miles an hour, but every time another town tries to get 20 mile an hour speed limits around schools and residential areas and shops, a bunch of people, normally men, write to the local paper saying how terrible it is that they can't drive at 30 miles an hour again. We don't know that if you are caught speeding in Finland, you can pay a fine of £80,000, 80000 if your income is high enough, because speeding fines are proportional to income. Just have a think how you'd behave if speeding fines were proportional to your income here. It wasn't just three points. <laughs> and you may think, oh, that's Scandinavia, that's the Finns. But it's even better in Switzerland. Depends on your canton. But my favourite example in Switzerland is that it's from a Peter Fender. It's a very rich man in a sports car who decided to drive twice through a village at 85 miles an hour, just at 85 through a village. Didn't hit anybody. £180,000 fine. Like, you don't do it again, do you? Right. The Swiss, you know, these are the... You can see I'm frustrated by this because it seems when you step back so obvious I wouldn't go straight to this, it would be a bit of a shock, although we'd soon clear the deficit, 
you know, if you're worried about raising um, it, when people say it's hard to do anything, we'd, we're just not aware of what is normal elsewhere. Um, we've had a huge and sudden increase in drug deaths as well. Um, it came a bit late, I thought it would come a, a year early with the recession, but it now has hit. Uh, the biggest rise, I think, in 15 years in the last 12 months. Uh, this is a graph from North America about increased rates of poor mental health as diagnosed by clinicians amongst 15 year old girls. We are similar. The other mainland European countries and Japan don't have this rise. Um, and why would North America and the UK have a rise in anxiety like this amongst 15 year olds, particularly the girls, and not mainland Europe? Because how you perform and achieve and do well at school or get into university really matters in an unequal country. Because if you do well, you will have an income so many times higher than people at the bottom. This isn't a country where you can decide to do the kind of job where you think you're going to enjoy doing it. You have to think about how much they pay for that job. In other countries, the amount that people are paid for doing different jobs is much more similar. Cleaners are paid twice as much in Japan than they are here. At the other end of the scale, it's dramatic. We have over 2,200 bankers paid over a million euros a year. We only know this because the European Commission insists on asking the banks. Uh, our government asks every year that they stop asking. 2,200 paid over a million euros a year. The next highest is in Germany with 197. We have more bankers paid over a million euros a year than the rest of Europe put together several times over. Our bankers have nowhere to go if we cut their pay. Nobody's paying them that much apart from New York. And the American bankers are not about to give up their jobs for some British bankers. I won't go through the depression about the drug deaths. I've left it up long enough there for people who have a short attention span and like to read and listen at the same time. Uh, but it's not good news, and it should be news, and it's not great. And the reaction of the government when this was released a few months ago, I shall show you in a minute. Uh, rise in Prozac in Scotland, similar in Britain. Uh, one in ten of the population in Scotland are taking Prozac or a similar antidepressant every day, taking yourself away from the problem. When I'm cynical and depressed sometimes, and I am an optimistic person, and I'm, I'm going to speed up because I'm only going to do another 10 minutes, so please think of questions. When I'm being depressed, I wonder why we just don't put it in the water. It would be much easier. Um, but I think this is a temporary problem we are in. When those increases in deaths and overdoses were announced a few months ago, the reaction of the government was to say, any death related to drugs is a tragedy. Our drug strategy is about helping people get off drugs and stay off them for good. We will continue to help local authorities give daily treatment to users, so on. So the statistics don't matter. Could double again, double again, double again. Any death is a tragedy. We will continue to help local authorities. A local resident of Oxfordshire wrote to the council asking them why they were cutting all the services, and you can read it there. Um, he said, why are you cutting the services when you've only had a slight reduction in your funding to Ian Hudspeth, Huts the Conservative leader of the, of the County Council in Oxfordshire? Ian, very ambitious Conservative, he doesn't want to annoy the High Command, wrote back and said actually they'd had a cut of 72 million in their spending, or 37% of budgets, and it wasn't slight. And the resident, of course, who was complaining was David Cameron, who wrote a letter saying, why are you cutting local services? This is what I mean by they do not know what they are doing. Um, and that's better than them knowing, I think, what they are doing, but it should be worrying to us. We also, and they also, because we're not that dissimilar, don't know that there are so many other options. In the Netherlands, 50% of people walk or cycle to work because they've arranged things so that they can walk and cycle uh, to work. In the United States, they've done the opposite. Only 3.5% of people walk and cycle to work. Not because the United States is a particularly spread out country, 
but because there are people who deliberately do not allow you to build pavements in the United States. It's a different way of, of thinking. The health service. We have a wonderfully efficient health service. It ranks on at least five international measures amongst the top in the world on just how efficient it is. And we celebrate how wonderful it is. The BBC and the NHS are the two things we think are great. And it is efficient, but we don't spend money on it. So spending per person is 49% higher in Germany, 41% higher in Denmark, 27% higher in France. It is twice as high in Switzerland. And it's not because the Swiss have a higher GDP per capita than us. They've just decided to spend twice as much on health than we do. 81% higher in Norway, 59% higher in the Netherlands. Despite the fact that they're walking and cycling to work so they hardly need a health service because they're getting themselves fit as it is. Um, it's I think it's staggering. Um, and I'll show, you, I'll show you mainly why, why we're spending so, so little on our health service. Um, here it is. Now remember, George Osborne, the UK is a high tax and high spending country. The UK is the thick line there. This is a portion of GDP spent on public services in a sense it is almost identical to what the tax take is, which is heading towards 36% of GDP. The range of possibilities is enormous. Almost everywhere else taxes and spends more than us in Europe. That's why our health spending is so low, because we don't tax. It's also because we like spending things on things that other countries don't spend on. Only France has nuclear weapons. They really don't help your health very much. Um, there was a spending under Labour. I don't know if this thing will work. Oh, yeah. Do you remember all that stuff about um, Labour not fixing the roof <coughs> when the sun's shining? There it is. I think it was very bad because that little triangle there is the cost of the Iraq war. And I think they'd have done much better not to have done that war. But anyway, there it is. Everybody has to spend a lot of money when there's an international crash. We advise Ireland they should bail out every bank and guarantee every deposit, which is really good advice for them. So down, down here. And it was uh, George. We gave him a little loan as well to follow our advice. So that's the country that followed our advice. In Finland, GDP fails, so they increased public spending so their quality of life wouldn't have to fall. Here's Greece, basket case. Still manages 41% here's us. We're choosing to be here. George wanted to be down here. But he can't get down here because he's got to spend a bit more because he can't get the deficit down. But the point is, we're not in a normal place. So when I say that our poor health, and I hope I've shown you that our health is poor, is related to the fact that we allow a small proportion of people to be so rich. And one of the reasons we allow them is that we have very low rates of taxation on them. I think the things are, are very obviously related, but it's more complicated how we got there and why we got there. Here's your list of options. You remember that stuff? You know, it's all technology, it's due to talent, it's, you know, it's inevitable, you have to do this, it's happening in every country. This is what's actually happening in different countries. You have a choice. The Scots know they have a choice. Currently on opinion polls, 50%, over 50% of Scots would vote for independence <laughs> at the moment. If we vote to leave the EU, they're going to vote to leave us. And they've got the oil. And we've just got sterling and some bankers. Some bankers that wouldn't be in the EU anymore. We, we need to think very carefully about it. We are very odd. It's a very strange time. This final graph is showing you the segregation index for the Conservative Party is how many people you'd have to move across the country, the whole of the United Kingdom, to get an even proportion of Conservative voters everywhere. It was very polarised in the past. Over things like religion, Protestant areas were Conservative in Glasgow. Lots of Conservatives in Glasgow and Liverpool. Catholic areas were Labour or Liberal. That kind of polarisation reduced. That measure reduced. 50s and 60s, Conservatives led everywhere few more in some places than others, so they win the seats with a few more, don't win the seats with others. But the country was more mixed politically, as well as being more equal economically. And then, steady increase in polarisation. 
If you're a nerd about it, it was the October 1974 election. So how many people were voting here in October 1974? Got anybody? Great. There we are. You could have made all the difference back then. <laughs> Not that I blame you. Uh, and if you're down here, in, in October 1974, the southeast of the country swung, swung to the Conservatives. The miners' strike had been won by the miners. It's really annoying if you're a southerner. Um, South East swings to the Conservatives, not on the votes, Labour win, that's the jump. Margaret Thatcher is made leader of the Conservative Party in 1975, Conservatives win in 1979. Turns out, in retrospect, 1974 was key, just nobody knew at the time how important it was. From then onwards, increased polarisation of the vote, so at the last election the Labour vote goes up in London, it goes up in Oxford East, it goes up in Sheffield, it goes up anywhere I live. <laughs> I kind of I've been, I feel like a walking Labour kind of disease virus. You know, if I go to Nuneaton, Nuneaton will vote Labour next time. Um, that last rise in polarisation is truly amazing. It's three elections worth in one go, and it has nothing to do with Scotland, because there were almost no Conservative voters left in Scotland before the election. Um, it is connected to Liberal. Isn't it? I I get interested in these things, but. The point of it is to say, look, we've actually exceeded the last polarisation. We are more divided now geographically between people who believe one kind of thing is right and another kind of thing is right than we were any time since 1918. It's very, very interesting things and interesting times and it is very strange. I couldn't have predicted any of what has happened since 2006-2007. But the crash has actually meant we've become more divided and it hasn't got better. A final quote from John in the 1930s. He made a series of predictions about 2030. And you may find a lot of what I've just said quite depressing. You may well disagree with me and, and I would be very interested in that. But I wouldn't be pessimistic from what I've just said. We are only seven or eight years away from the crash. When we last had a crash like this in 1929, the immediate reaction for most people, and most financiers, but not from the ones who remember like Keynes, who was different, the immediate reaction was, this is terrible, but we should just get back to business as usual. In the States, it took them four years before they could vote the president out in 1933 and actually have a new deal. Uh, in this country, we had a conservative liberal coalition from 1935 onwards, a mass unemployment, and didn't do very much. If you told somebody in 1936 or 1937 that for their children and grandchildren, things were going to get much, much, much better, that they would get much better health care, that it wouldn't matter if they were born rich or poor, they'd be able to go to school without paying. They'd be able to go to the same school as everybody. They'd be able to go to university. Half of all of their great-grandchildren, if they were female, would go to university. If you told people that in the 1930s, I think they would have thought you were mad at the time. For that reason, I do not think it is impossible for things to get better in this country. Uh, but they don't get better unless you actually recognise that they're bad. So you need to recognise that you are in a strange situation, that you are taxing low, you are spending low. It does damage people, it does result in children being much more likely to die. We are accepting a higher rate of road traffic accidents. Our mental health is worse, we are taking more pills. You need to recognise this. And it isn't because we are individually fallible and weaker and not strong-willed, it is because of the nature of the society we've adapted. I think if you can recognise that, it is possible to see that we could move in a different direction. And the final thing to say, of course, statistically, because I like numbers, if you have got to a point where you are becoming the most unequal country in the world amongst the rich countries, there is only one way of travel in the future. It is actually very hard to carry on being at that extreme. So just by chance, we're probably going to get a bit better because it takes quite a lot of hard work to, to get that degree of inequality. 
and I can't see politicians carrying on trying so hard to get house prices to go up and up in London and to be satisfied with these widening divisions and trying so hard when they realise what's happening to not tell the people who are voting for them what is actually going on. It is much easier if you're a politician to advocate policies that increase inequality if you don't know that's what your policies are doing. Thank you very much. So, um, I'm Paul Rodriguez, I'm the co-chair of the, uh, the USIG with uh, Graham, Professor of Public Health. Before I sum up and give a second formal vote of thanks, Dan is very happy to take questions. It's been a fantastic engrossing talk, and I'm sure the issues he's covered, there will be questions. So, if the people in the back, you can shout, I'll, I'll try and uh, order the questions as I see, I see their hands go up. So, David first. Yeah. Um, Pickett and Wil Wil Wilkinson present fairly convincing data to my mind that um, inequality not only drives down the health of the poorest, but also the wealthier, so the wealthier do badly when there's inequality. Mm. And this argues really that the effects of inequality are much deeper and pernicious than, than just you know, who gets money and how we can pump up um, health services and the like. And I wonder what your response to that is. Um, they're right, the, the gaps are bigger for the poor, they are there for the rich, so if you have unsafe roads, actually the roads are a good example, uh, the young children most likely to die on the roads are actually children in rich rural areas, uh, particularly 17 year olds when somebody goes and gives them a car in the, in the new forest. But it's not just about road accidents. No, no, no. In, 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 general, in general, the rich are slightly better off in more equal countries, which is why in Japan they live longer than anywhere else, which is why ABBA did much better than Michael Jackson, if you want to be trite about it. Um, so, so you're right, but the, but the gap isn't, isn't enormous for the very rich, um, but it's there. Mental health is much, much stronger. So the worst mental health in the United States is in Los Angeles, and it's in Beverly Hills, and it's in the... Yeah, so the very affluent, if they're worried about their mental health or the mental health of their children, who have to perform so well. Now, if you're the child of a very affluent parent, they're going to spend a lot on your education and the expectations on you to get A's and A stars, a B's no good. And it's not a question about going to university, it's are you going to get into the right college in one of those two universities? Um, you know, the mental health of the very rich is... is a, so I, I, think, I think this is useful, but it, it's very hard to study the rich, they tend to hide. Two of the slides that, that, that you um, presented, um, where you referred to um, sanctions in, in benefits and um, uh, mental health and drug-related drug death, both of which uh, spiked a little bit in Southampton recently, not ducking the trends. But when I looked at the suicide rate in Southampton, I'm chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board here. Our comparative group, which includes places like Sheffield, Derby, Coventry, Salford, London Borough, Brent, that our um, uh, uh, rate is higher than those places. Yeah. Separately, I'm aware, because of the lo local network of intelligence, that Southampton <coughs> experiences the third highest rate of sanctions for benefits. Mm. And I wondered whether there is an association and what evidence might exist to demonstrate that. It's quite a powerful political message to, to, to make that charge, yes. but I think it will resonate with people's own experience. But at the moment, um, I suppose politically I want to make one message, but I'm very anxious to make sure that it's backed up it's by correct. science and evidence. Um, ben Barr and colleagues in the last four weeks published in the British Medical Journal uh, the correlation between sanctions and rise in death. So it's, that's one of the papers that's out. There are a lot of papers. They're being refereed by people, because um, that one's out. If you don't know about sanctions, uh, in 2000, and two, financially, I think 2012-13, uh, the sanctions, this is money taken away from people because they haven't turned up for a job interview or something else, mainly from women because they're looking after children and so can't turn up. The amount of money that was taken away from 
people claiming benefits, uh, which was over a million, was more than the entire fines handed out to every criminal in Britain by every magistrate and sheriff in Scotland. Um, so it's the most dramatic thing. We've actually taken more money away from people who are failing to apply for enough jobs than from people who shoplift. Um, and that, that just happened. Incidentally, it happened, the minister in charge at the time was um, Sarah Tever, who resigned. And when she resigned, uh, the Prime Minister and the leader of the Liberals said that you have to have a tough backbone to be at the top in politics. Whereas it turns out what they were actually asking her to do was to take away money from the poorest people in Britain. And it now turns out, and it's in the medical journal, this has resulted in a big, big rise of thousands of deaths. Um, so I'm very grateful to have ever resigned. But the story about the fact that she was actually on the side of the angels you know, needs to be told, I think, over that. Can you link the lack of recognition of these issues to the way in which the press is controlled? And can you map globally the lack of recognition in other countries and the control of the press in other countries and relate that to these issues? Uh, you can have a go. The annoying place is Italy because of Berlusconi, <laughs> which really upsets the correlation, but, but you can... I do think, I mean, our press is controlled by very wealthy people and people at the top of the BBC are pretty well off, the ones in front of the camera, not the ones behind the camera. It, it goes back to this issue of, I, I do think these people don't know. You know. I do think they believe a story that poor health is about the fact that you don't look after yourself and you don't have enough self-respect. And if you just got to grip and behave better, uh, it will be better. And it's not because of these other things. And when presented with the information that, you know, you can look at numerous things and it's much worse where you do have people like, um, I, won't, <laughs> I won't name them because they're very good at suing, but, you know, extremely rich people living on islands controlling newspapers, health is worse. Um, is, they just don't see it. It's amazing how they ignore it. For the spirit level evidence, when that came out, uh, the three political parties each produced a response. The Liberals were actually the nearest to saying, yes, we agree with this at the time. Uh, Labour said, we're actually narrowing inequalities to so stop complaining when they actually weren't. The Conservative response was the most interesting. It said, oh, this is interesting. If we can make it so that people don't know they're economically unequal, would health get better? Um, so as long as you, you know, can we have wide inequalities? Uh, but find a way of, you know, you being happy with your place and not actually aware that somebody else is getting that much more than you. Uh, and they wrote a 50,000 word pamphlet on whether they could do that. And in a sense, it's kind of what they've done. You know, we're not actually that aware that, you know, if you've got children in the state school, your children have about up to five times less spent on their education than children in private schools per year that your children have less spent on them than any other large country in Europe, that if your child is in the sixth form, that money's been cut by 25% in the last two years, do you know? We don't know. So. There's a pressure at the back there, there's one gap, one gap does. Thank you. Uh, today we heard there's going to be a big increase in the number of armed response vehicles, but no explanation of how the squeeze of the police service is going to afford that. When armed response safety officers who are diverted. I work in, as a volunteer in a county town near New Wiltshire, where all the traffic control is done by volunteers. There are no police doing it at all. And I wonder why nobody's asking the question about the balance between combating the deaths from terrorism and combating the deaths from road casualties. I'm interested in your yeah. response. Okay. Um, by chance, I, I had to write something on that last week, of course, I wouldn't know. Um, the, the, the famous one is how more people died on the roads in America after 9-11 because they were too afraid to fly uh, than died in 9-11 um, because roads are so dangerous. These, the biggest killer in this country between ages 5 and 25 uh, are roads. If more people drive after them fly, you get that many more, more deaths. Um, 
It, but it's not just the police that help by enforcing the law. The, the more effective way is to get the speed down. In most European cities, you're looking at 30 kilometres an hour, which is 18 and a half miles, not, not 20. But you do want to worry about the roads outside the cities going at uh, speed. There is good news stories. We have a remarkably low murder rate, given our rate of inequality. These things generally correlate pretty well, murders and inequality. Uh, one of the reasons we have a remarkably low murder rate is done plain, in that we just simply took the handguns out of the country. So you can do simple things. You can actually have a country where every other push should suggest that it should be worse, but you know, actually taking handguns out of a country and making the Olympic squad fly out to train uh, does have a benefit. Okay, three more and I have the last word. So there's a gentleman here, one at the back of the mic. So the gentleman here. Towards the end, you tried to sound a more optimistic note, and you mentioned about how from the 30 onwards there was a period of um, increased equality. Uh, but how much of that do you think was driven not by something within society, but by the Second World War and what happened after yeah. that? Okay, I'll do that one. Um, the falls happened in, in all rich countries, uh, and the First World War affected some of them, the First World War, but not all. The Russian Revolution probably had an effect on the minds of people in the 1%. You know, I think it was a, quite a shock to, to see what a revolution is actually like. Um, half our equality was gained before 1939. It's just we didn't recognise we were becoming more equal. The Second World War helped solidify it, um, not just because people fought together, but because a generation of young people were so angry with their parents that their parents had gone through a world war had not learned from it, were going to make them fight, having just handed them mass unemployment and a crash. Uh, so I, th I think one reason to be optimistic is, if you get a young generation who says, you've handed me a really raw deal and you didn't have to do this, uh, then you can get change. And I think we are about to hand we have three years worth of university students paying full fees. By 2020, we'll have eight years worth and their parents. Uh, private renting is increasing in London by 1% a year to head towards Dickensian rates within 50 years. If I was 18 or 20 or 25 or 35 and renting, I think I would be abandoning the idea that somehow I'm going to make it and I would become quite angry. And I would blame the generation above me not just those of you who voted differently in 1974. Um, and I, So part of my optimism is how much can you treat people in this way, and particularly the children of the middle class. You know, what is your future as a well-behaved middle class child in Britain? What's going to be expected of you? How precarious is your life going to be? And how can you become a parent? How will you be able to have children? There were many things that you might say were worse in the 1970s. But you could become parents in your 20s and get a home. Um, and the fact that we can't do that anymore, I think people are going to stop blaming themselves for that and begin to realise uh, that there's another reason why they can't do that. Question at the back. Yeah, that Okay, quick ones. Um, not having the lowest property taxes in the world. Um, so in London, you just introduce more council tax bans. Um, just beginning to do, even talking about it. Uh, not having the lowest and least progressive rates of income tax in Europe. So not a sudden change, just an extra 5p, go back to 50. Um, but talk about, and the reason you increase income tax at very high salaries is not to raise taxation, it's not to raise money. The reason you want to say have a 60% rate on an income of a million and 65 on two million is to help very greedy people not demand those incomes. So in countries which have more progressive taxation, I don't know, university vice-chancellors um, <laughs> are less likely to say, I actually I need another 100,000 on top of that to take the job, I'm afraid. Because they know that say 60, with national insurance, 70% of that extra 100,000 would go straight to the Treasury. 
they'd only get 30,000, and 30,000 is only a slightly mediocre holiday in Tuscany. Whereas 100,000 is a hell of a cruise. Um, so I can carry on. There's, there's lots of things you can do. But the nice thing about being Britain is all we need to do is just look 100 miles that way, that way, and that way to see what to do. You can pay trivial pursuit policy. You know, pick education, health, employment, whatever it is, pick a country in Europe, look at what they do, and that's why we don't do it. So I, I want to ask you why so few people know this, Nick, and, and specifically why the opposition and the left-wing press are so bad at getting these messages across. That's a good question. We don't have much of a left-wing press. The, the Guardian, <laughs> the, I mean, the, the Guardian newspaper isn't that. You know, it really has taken it a long time to get used to Mr. Corbyn. I think it's suddenly worked out that three and a thousand Labour Party members is a hell of a market for selling your newspaper to. And what are you playing at? Uh, not to, but we don't. You know, there's just the Mirror and the Guardian. And they're playing a game of trying to be in the middle because they sell more papers. Uh, the BBC is, is, when looked at objectively from studies in Glasgow and looked at from outside Britain, is mildly one nation Tory. We, we just don't have. And, and part of the explanation about how we can be this unequal is because we don't have that kind of a press and that kind of a discourse. Otherwise, we wouldn't have got in this situation. We're not yet as bad as the States, although we're set to overtake them, and we don't have Fox News. Um, yeah, but we carry on moving this direction. Suppose they do privatise the BBC. Suppose the BBC, who's that man they've now put on the Today programme, the one who used to be the chair of the Conservative Association in Oxford? Anybody know? Nick, yeah. Suppose the BBC don't put Nick on all the time, whatever they have to do, so that they're allowed to keep the licence fee high. And Nick Robinson isn't put on, and the government decides that they're a pinko organisation, and says, "I'm afraid we've got to fix the roof while the sun isn't shining. We can't afford the BBC anymore. We're going to have to sell it off to the highest bidder." Then we, our media would move to the right, uh, and our thinking could move uh, to the right. It's circular. Um, thinking in the country, when we look at people's attitudes in different countries. People in more unequal countries are more likely to trust others less, to say people take what they want, to say you can't let people have freedom, you've got to make them work hard because they won't work hard otherwise. When you look at people's views in more equal countries, they say people are good, they'll look after each other, they will work hard given the chance, you don't have to penalise them, there's no need to pay somebody very much. We are. We are remarkable. In every country in the rest of the rich world, including the United States, you can find somebody who's a business leader, and the most famous example is the boss of Royal Dutch Shell, who will say, if you pay me twice as much, I won't work any harder. And if you pay me half as much, I would work just as hard. In every single rich country in the world, there's somebody who says this, apart from the UK. We haven't yet got a single business person saying that. They all toe the line, double my pay and I'll work even harder, as if they can make a day be 50 hours long rather than 24. Before I come to the thanks, maybe I just have one last question. Uh, yeah. You mentioned Europe a lot, and you've shown us the influence and importance of politics of the big P. Mm. Just linking those two, would you be more or less optimistic if we come out of Europe or we stay in Europe for the future of public yeah. health? Uh, I'm short-term pessimistic. I think there would be an immediate house price crash um, because the Scotland will come in and all kinds of other problems in Scotland would try and go and the health would damage. But I do think if we did leave, mainland Europe would be able to do more interesting things because we wouldn't be stopping them. Um, <laughs> and we are the biggest drag on European policy. And then 20 years later we could crawl back with our tail between our legs and join with, I don't know, £10 to the euro, whatever they'd let us take. If that sounds fanciful, when I was a child, you used to get 10 francs to the pound. Do you remember going to France, anybody my age? You know, we have actually <coughs> dropped. Uh, and one of our big problems, to let us off, you know, why are, why are we so weird? We were the richest country on the planet 100 years ago. We owned half the world when my grandfather was young. It's not easy if you lose that. It's not easy to adapt to not having that anymore. 
And I, I think part of trying to understand why we are so strange, why the United States is so, so strange, is realising that most affluent countries when we're never in that position and also have to be all in it together because the tanks did roll over them or they lost a war. The really fast way to become more equal is to lose a war and have the invading forces decide that your elite can no longer own the land they used to have. That's why Japan and Germany are so equal. Thank you. So before I thank you, I'd just like to thank the audience. I'd like to thank the audience. Big audience here, and, and I know there's many from within the university, but many outwards. So, thanks to all those guests from outside who've come to this. And this seems to be what the university should be about: is the public lectures covering such a wide range of topics. I want you to just ask one quick show of hands because you mentioned about the young. I just wondered how many students were here. Fantastic, that's really good. So, I hope you learned a lot from today, and we'll carry on reading Danny's uh, books and articles. So, um, so thanks to the audience, and then thank you, Danny, for such a fantastic talk. It fits uh, in our public health series. It was fitting for that. You covered social policy, history, geography, politics, uh, housing and its influence on health. Um, personally, it reminded me why I used to fall out with my mother about Mrs. Thatcher from the Daily Mail. Um, my daughter's a teacher in London, so all the things you, uh, you've, been, you've been talking about. And having used your slides um, a lot in, in talks, it's great to actually meet you and hear you uh, in person. I think you've given more of a diagnosis than a prescription, but I see there's a book, yeah. March 16, the, the New Politics, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it seems to me that New Politics is what we need, and we're in a grip of a neoliberal uh, advice, and uh, maybe it's the New Politics, so that's for the younger generation to really find. So, um, without more ado, I'd just like you to raise your hands once more, and uh, thank Danny for his truly fantastic talk. Uh, thank you very, very thank much. Thank you very much.